We're going to talk about the chart of the I am presence. And there is a definite advantage to talking about it. For the simple reason that it is a form <coughs> presentation of your electronic reality. It is very beneficial to you personally. If you can think of yourself as you really are and forget yourself as you are not. Now the self that is not is referred to in a certain place in Revelation as the beast that was and is not and still is. And that's why I mentioned the elephant. Because you see, we get in our own way. We know it. Someone said to me, oh, we don't know it. Oh, yes, we do. Down deep in our heart, we know that we get in our own way a lot of times. That is, the human gets in God's way, and we are really created in the divine image. Now, the chart helps us to realize the reality of ourselves. Many people have not been told about the chart in the world today. They know nothing of the chart. And this is a case of where what you don't know does hurt you. Do you see? Because when you know the meaning of this chart, you never again are alone. Not if you practice it. If you did not have an eye picture of your being at all, it would be somewhat difficult for you to actually know yourself. Now stop for a minute and think about the birth of a baby and recognize that when that baby is born he has no knowledge of the world of form, whatever. He comes in and he blinks his little eyes and that which registers on the retina of his eyes and is conveyed to the brain by impulse has no meaning. Mother, mama, this doesn't mean anything to the baby as far as words go. There are no word images. The forces of nature work through the child so that he eats and he sleeps and he lives almost as a vegetable for a while. Because the child does not know what his own ten fingers are for. He doesn't even know what his feet and his little tiny toes are for. He kicks around and wiggles and turns over without even knowing that he's turning over. He doesn't even know which way is up, you see. We really come into the world a sad mess, don't we? I mean from the standpoint of what we are after we're here a while. Someone's shaking their head. You want to tell me why? Are you, you think we're not a sad mess when we're born? Like a bug. Like a bug? Well, that's a beautiful way of putting it. I'm glad I asked you. You see, I can always learn something. There's a lot to be learned. But what I meant was, is something a little different than that. I mean that at that point in our existence, we do not have the comprehension of our senses. We do not understand the meaning of what we see. We do not understand the meaning of what we hear. We do not know ourselves, although we have a consciousness. This is a case of a pretty clean slate. And as the months go by, we acquire in less than a year the knowledge of all of the limbs, locomotion and use of the hands, familiarize ourselves with words and understand the language, understand the meaning of mother and father and friends that are around us, and we gain a considerable knowledge of the wide, wide world the first year on earth. Now I think this is a blessed cosmic miracle. 
and it is wonderful. But this same law applies to the knowledge of the presence. Because here we are dealing not with something that is visible to our senses, but is visible to our cosmic senses. And the eye picture of the chart has brought that magnificent, invisible, but all-powerful electronic presence of ourselves before our being as form for one purpose, to inform us as to the reality of our self. The ancient temples with the inscription across the top, Man, know thyself, are aided and abetted to a magnificent degree by the chart. This chart is valuable. It is perhaps the most valuable possession you can have outside of the reality. For it is a symbol of a reality. And it has a purpose, and that is to quicken in our consciousness the advent of the presence. The Holy Christ Self, the violet fire, and the tube of light. Now I know that you've heard the story, most of you, many times, to the point, I suppose, where after a while you begin to almost discount its reality about the gentleman or the master over in India who stood there and someone took an elephant gun and shot at him. I don't know why they had to use an elephant gun, but that's the way the story goes. And when the bullet came to the edge of his tube of light about here, it flattened out and the lead just smashed down and dropped to the ground. Well, it happens to be true, but I suppose it would have worked just as well with a 22 or a 50 millimeter shell. It wouldn't make any difference. But it's an interesting story, isn't it? It shows you the efficacy of the tube of light. I've heard quite a few other stories. One man was in Washington one day and he was struck by a bus. But because he had on his tube of light, there was a crash and the bus didn't hurt him at all, but I guess he hurt the bus, I don't know. But anyway, he didn't get hurt in the least. There was just a crash. And as I understand it, he said, well, you didn't hurt me. And the driver or somebody got out and said, did we hurt you? And he said, no, you just touched my tube of light. And they looked at him as if he was a little bit crazy and walked off and got back in. They thought maybe they did strike him in the head. You know. <laughs> well, that's the way it is with people. Because unless you experience something for yourself, you have a right to be skeptical to a degree. However, you may not see your presence, that is all of you, but you do see this chart. And that's the important thing because the chart is a scientific explanation of your reality, your divine reality. Now let us examine that chart very closely. This lower figure in the chart is symbolical of your finite self, your human form. I don't like to compare you to a piece of bologna, <laughs> but in one sense, <coughs> bologna sausage actually has a skin around it, and you cram the meat down in there, and it's in its skin, you see. Well, that's the way we are. We're crammed down into this body, and we're in our skin, aren't we? Yes. <laughs> Whether we like it or not, or are comfortable there, we're there. And this figure down here is symbolical of the little man that's down here in his skin having seven bodies of course and the four lower bodies of man actually in one sense of the word interpenetrate the form now the reason I mention that in a humorous way as I did is because it happens to be basically true. Uh, it is, it's basically true. 
And I can think of no way of doing it better than to come down to earth for a moment because if we start in heaven, we may never know when we get there, you see. <laughs> you understand that, how you gaze at a blinding light? And uh, no matter how bright it gets, as long as it's blinding, you see, you can't see it anyway. So there has to be a contrast. And that's the beauty of heaven because I think God puts us down here on earth so that by becoming acquainted with all the vibratory actions that occur down here, we really appreciate it. It's like someone knocking their head against a cement wall. They say that it feels so good when they quit. <laughs> and that's basically the truth of it. Because after you get socked by your own karma and a few other people's karma, you get to the point where you don't know which way is up and which way is down, why then you're ready for heaven, we hope. It reminds me of the story of the young man who was very nervous going overseas. And he was so nervous and so shaken all over that he was actually breaking out in a cold sweat. And so his friend came up to him to comfort him and he said, well, I tell you, my friend, I wouldn't worry too much about that. He says, there's always a possibility you won't pass your physical. And he said, well, he said, that's true. And he said, if you don't pass your physical, he said, uh, so there's two chances for you right there. You either pass it or you don't. And then he says, if you should pass your physical, he said, you may go overseas and you may not. They may decide to use you in the States. Says, that's true. You have two chances. So he said, well, Another thing too, he says, when you get overseas, you may not be sent into battle and you may be sent into battle. So you see, you have two chances. <laughs> so then he says, and if you get sent into battle, he said, you may not get killed and you may get killed. And he said, even if you get killed, you still have two chances. <laughs> <laughs> so that's very true. I don't want it, do you? I'd rather take the one chance. And this is the greatest chance that you can take to identify with God. It's your guarantee of 100% success. Not necessarily down here, though. Up here. But you have to bring this up here, down here. Now, actually, this is very much like a Silex coffee pot. A figure eight human is down here you see and here you have the silver cord you ever remember that old song where they used to say when the golden bowl is broken and the silver cord is loosened I forget how the rest of it went but something about you were going off to other shores never to be down here anymore or something like that you know very sad and I think they used to sing it at funerals but uh, it has a very definite reality now this beautiful silver cord here was put into song I mean people sang about it because mankind has known about that silver cord for a long time now you know and I'm sure you all realize that this activity has no contact whatever with anything that is spiritualistic. In other words, the Summit Lighthouse is never spiritualistic. We have no mediums in the Summit Lighthouse. We don't contact the departed or anything like that. And none of our dictations are given in trance, but in full consciousness with the Ascended Master's presence. I mention that for a reason, because I wanted to talk for a moment about something that is spiritualistic and tell you about it. Years ago, when spiritualism was first starting out, and at that time it had the approval of Master Kuthumi, he started the activity to give mankind faith in survival. You understand what I mean? Because many people were very sad and they lost loved ones, and in their great sadness, the masters felt perhaps if they could show the continuity of existence by permitting that step through of the consciousness, 
that it would help people, you see. And so they permitted it at that time. Later on, it became a definite Pandora's box where people got into the lower astral and all kinds of hate, hate creations and viciousness from the past came in with it until the masters had to withdraw completely from it as well as uh, withdraw their approval of it. In fact, they had to censure the activity and say, avoid it because people were actually going insane in some cases and others were getting involved in psychic phenomena till all they wanted was manifestation, manifestation, manifestation. They wanted people to pull flowers out of the air and rabbits out of hats and be a genuine Houdini, you see. Well, phenomena is funny. Many years ago, before I was given the knowledge that I now have by God's grace, and the knowledge of this I am law, and directly under St. Germain at a time when I was working with the Masters, but not so closely because I had not come to a certain point, but I still had some of my old Atlantean capacities. So I met a young man, and I talked to him about his soul and about immortality. I'm coming back to the uh, medium in a minute, but I want to finish this. I took this young man in his own home, and I stretched out my hand and made a manifestation of fire appear in the air, visible to him. And he saw this, he saw the control of the flame at the outstretched hand. He saw the flame obey my word. I took him out of his body and he floated in the air, right above, just like that. He was floating. He thought I was the greatest that ever walked. You know, three weeks later, his wife told him, she said, if you don't quit following that man, I'm leaving you. And he proceeded immediately to leave me. Can you imagine that? <laughs> <laughs> and he was no longer interested in anything at all that I could do or would do. This is phenomena. And the masters know, and the master showed me through that lesson, that you could materialize gold. You could heal someone from their diseases. You could do anything for people. This is when the chips are down, when they're feeling very low, and you help them. But when they no longer feel that they have any use for you or have any need of you, they're ready to dump you after they've chewed you up. And they just put you out that quick. They don't want you anymore. They're through with you. It's interesting, but it's true. Phenomena is not the way to God. Not that type of phenomena. But attunement is the way to God. Attunement with God's consciousness, and then you can have all these things added on to you, and it all comes to your mighty I am presence. Now coming back, I must skip around a little bit, to these mediums. The mediums noticed that when people passed on and they were in the room, that something silvery seemed to disconnect from their body and flowed into the air like a nice beautiful silver ribbon and go up through the air because they could see with clairvoyant sight, you see. This then I mention because the silver cord is known and has been seen by clairvoyance. Well, we know that it exists because we feel it. Going back into past ages of time, as the great divine director has pointed out in his current series, long ago, this silver cord was as wide as the tube of light, and the stream of energy from your presence was just magnificent. It came down all around you. You didn't have to invoke the tube of light because that was flowing from God all the time, and men lived to be eight and nine hundred years old. Because, you see, this vital shower like a Niagara Falls was just pouring life down into their physical form. It kept out imperfection, kept out disease. It maintained contact with God for them. Then mankind began to abuse the law. And so, by divine decree and by the edict of the karmic board, in order to prevent mankind from misusing God's energy because they are all accountable for how much energy they use, God took away 
this tremendous shower of energy and shrunk the tube of light to become a silver cord which actually comes in through the soft spot on the baby's head at the top. Once that is anchored in the heart and brings a threefold flame into life there and the child moves and lives, soft spot begins to close up. And by the time the child is about a year old, there is no more soft spot. Natural science, divine cosmic science, is a magnificent thing then. And we see that the meaning of the silver cord is very great because the silver cord is the lifeline to our presence. And that lifeline can be expanded, so the great divine director says. For those willing to make the call, the lifeline can be expanded. But bear in mind, dear hearts, that every one of us, all of us, are responsible for the energy we draw. Therefore, we must ask that we may receive and use that energy constructively always. I know, the image always amuses me, I know a very nervous people. I've seen nervous people. And you see sometimes boys and girls in some of these jazz orchestra places too where they're chewing gum, you know, <laughs> chewing gum, and then they're diddling with one foot, you know. You know what I mean? And they're chewing gum, and they're, they just don't know what to do with themselves. They're just bouncing with energy, see? Just think of all that nervous energy, all sent out in wrong thought. Is it any wonder they're nervous? Now bring that energy under control and use it to heal the cells of the body. Bring that energy under control and use it to make the mind still. And the mind then becomes a clear pool. And in that clear pool, the reflection of your real self can shine. You see, as long as you have a choppy surface, you don't know whether you look like Fatty Arbuckle or Slim Jim. You don't know who you look like if you look in the water. One minute you look fat, the next minute you look thin. And the image is shaking like this. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But still that pool down, and you see a true reflection of yourself. And if you can avoid the sin of Narcissus, you beautiful ladies, I mean, you won't fall in love with yourself and then fall in and drown in the pool of self. See what I mean? You know... You remember the story of Narcissus? Okay, let's come back now. Let's come right back and find out what we have here. This is a serious business. Don't you dare to laugh. Not even snicker. This, of course, is the human. Here is the threefold flame. Here is the silver cord. Here is your mighty I am present. Here is your holy Christ self or higher mental body. And of course, this is the tube of light. And the blue fire is called up around it. And this is your causal body around here. This is the treasures of heaven, the causal body. The important thing that I want to convey in this lecture is that this gentleman down here is constantly changing his mind. One minute he's running hot, the next minute he's running cold. The human is just the most vacillating thing you ever saw. And that's why the masters marvel at the constancy of this group here. We have people that never miss a class. We have people that come here sick or well. They come to get better, they go home feeling better. The constancy that is expressed then in this activity is a different type of constancy than you see in the world today with all their vacillation and change. And this has convinced me, because I've been convinced too, along with everyone else, that the Ascended Masters have something to offer. <coughs> And I think that when St. Germain released the chart, that it was a beautiful gesture on his part. 
I would like to say something about the problems the masters have encountered with human creation. This is a side issue, but it's a very important thing because it deals with problems from the master's level. Now, what is truth? I want to ask you all. Pilate asked the question. He said, what is truth? Yes. But can you build a fence around God then and copyright God? Can you copyright God? How many people now living today in this world were alive a hundred years ago? And yet what a glorious treasure we have inherited from the past. A spiritual treasure. We have the Holy Bible. We have John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. We have a wealth of beautiful spiritual books. The Prophet by Khalil Gibran. Thomas the Kempis, Imitation of Christ. We have a wealth of books. I couldn't begin to name them all. Beautiful works. The law says you can copyright them. But basically, coming right down to brass tacks, the Word of God is the Word of God. And it ought to be in the public domain. But the Word of God itself tells us not to break the law. So we respect the copyright law in its right way. Well, let me point out to you one of the reasons why there have been more than one chart created. In the old books on theosophy <coughs> and in the fire of creation by van der Lu, there were shown some of these very things that you see here. And this existed long before the so-called I am activity. In the theosophical books long before the I am activity existed way back in the 1800s, you see the chart of the causal body. I have some in the library I can show you. you do you believe that, you people? This was not an invention of one movement that started in 1930. This chart here was painted under the direction of St. Germain by Thomas Miller. Reverend Miller was on our staff right here in the front row. He didn't copy the chart from the I am activity. He took it directly under inspiration. But the master St. Germain knew that we had to have a chart. Do you see the point? We had to have a chart. And the master St. Germain wanted that chart close to the real thing, as close as he could get it. So you can't change the causal body. That has to be the same. This presence is only a symbol anyway. But I like the symbol here. I think it's beautiful. We have the descending dove of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came from the Father, which is the mighty I Am Presence, and it descends on the Christ Consciousness on the Christ self, the Holy Christ self, or the higher mental body. And that baptizes the Holy Christ self with the radiance of the Holy Spirit, the whole I Spirit, you see. Then you have the radiance, the love radiance of the Christ, the love of Christ in this beautiful expanding heart, the golden flame of illumination, the healing hands. You have down here the paraclete, which is the twin flames that represent the Holy Spirit descending from the Holy Christ self down into the heart of the human. And over here you have a little lighthouse. It's great beams sweeping out over the sea. You have the rocky coast. Here you have the violet flame, the most important part of all, in one way. Because as I told you before, there's two things that are sure, death and taxes. That's the saying the world has. And you'll never get out of this world alive except through the ascension. All right. The only way you really can make your ascension is through the violet flame. 
I don't care how people say they do it. There is no person that has ever made their ascension that hasn't had the violet flame given to them some way or another. They may not have all had the formula written down. They may not have all said, Beloved, mighty, victorious presence of God, I am in me, etc. But in some way they had to reach the state of consciousness where they could invoke the violet flame to consume their human creation. Because if you don't consume your human creation, dear hearts, you are never going to be able to win the battle of life. Because if you don't master your human creation, your human creation will master you. Rest assured of it. There's no two ways about a thing like this. We like to think that there's two ways, but this is only the human, and don't let the human fool you. The human will try. It will tell you that God isn't going to do anything about it anyway, that he's not concerned with you because you're so little. Well, Jesus said, there is not one jot or one tittle shall pass until all be fulfilled. Now, a jot and a tittle are pretty small little portions on the karmic scales. But if it gives you any consolation, your enemies will suffer to the uttermost for all the things they do to you, you see. <laughs> and consequently, you will suffer just as bad for anything you do to them. So probably the safest thing to do is to forget vengeance and forget and forgive immediately because it just doesn't pay to carry it out to the last farthing and seek your pound of flesh, Shylock. Because when you get your pound of flesh, it's an empty victory and a vendetta is never a happy circumstance. There is a moment of triumph when the enemy lays bleeding upon the ground and he is the vanquished and you are the victor. But this is soon replaced by remorse and the soul soon feels the pangs of guilt and wonders if in depriving this other of life, liberty, and happiness he perhaps will ever sleep again. So forget and forsake the idea of vengeance in any matter. Defend yourself if you have to. I don't think any one of you should give up your life to anyone because they want to take it. A couple of our girls have had experiences in Washington where they've been attacked. One of the girls, what was it you did, Wilma? Well, my body became automation, I guess, and I fought back. You fought back. And Mildred, the other girl that was attacked, she stuck her head down and roared like a lion at him, and they run away. <laughs> <laughs> I don't say you shouldn't protect yourself but by the grace of God you should also protect yourself against yourself because it's hard right to protect yourself at any given moment but don't carry that and let the sun go down upon thy wrath and then find out that while you're sound asleep the force of your human creation has gone out and created something that's caused them to die or to suffer. Do you understand what I mean? The soul of man can, so to speak, there's a part of your psyche that if you go to bed with anger at someone could go out and actually cause them to die. A lot of people don't know this. And the next day might come and you'd hear, oh, they passed away. And then you'd say, well, good enough, they deserved it. <laughs> well, they hurt me. And I'm pretty important. That's what they got. They got it. They deserved it. But what happens when the lords of karma come back and say, you did this. You see what I mean? So it's best that people forget. Forget every wrong as soon as it happens. If you only will do that, you will not be engaging in karma-making action. And then the violet flame that you use with the plus X factor will be able to remove some of that old crusty karma that's down inside your four lower body somewhere, lurking, and it needs to be scraped off like the barnacles off of a ship. You need more than a spring house cleaning. You need a complete renovation by violet flame. 
But if you're so busy creating, and I know of some people, I'd rather not mention them, who used to have a violet flame service and then a good fight in the sanctuary right afterward. <laughs> the idea was that they had the violet flame to pay their debts in advance, you see, and build up their credit. Well, this doesn't work. Because the record is clear. The purpose of the violet flame is to shed mercy upon the earth. And if people are going to have mercy, they've got to be merciful. And if they're going to think that they can use the violet flame just to make themselves feel good and clean up their human creation, the worst of the scum, off the surface, so that their pores can breathe, and then they're going to start in with their old hate and hate creations and fighting and wrangling and human viciousness and discord afterward and keep saying to the law we won't pay let them know that sooner or later the law will make them pay and the first thing they know the violet flame will not be working for them the way it should because they'll get so clogged up that the lords of karma will come down and say wait a minute you haven't paid your debt and we're turning off your light and power we're not going to give you any more violet flame now I'm saying this in a, a jovial sort of way. But believe you me, there is an inner law that's involved in this that this could happen. It could happen that you would lose your efficacy in the use of the violet flame if you just abuse it. And this was told to us by the keeper of the scrolls in a dictation quite a while ago, several years ago when the summit first started. So let's hold the violet flame by using common sense and not just going out and wasting our energy to create karma. You have only five more minutes to listen to me, thank God. This is one of the rings of the causal body. It is the blue ring and it is the protection, the envelope of protection and power. Lord Michael before me, Lord Michael behind, Lord Michael to the right, Lord Michael to the left, Lord Michael above, Lord Michael below, Lord Michael, Lord Michael, wherever I go. I am his love protecting here, I am his love protecting here, I am his love protecting here. Let's try that one. Lord Michael before me, Lord Michael behind, Lord Michael to the right, Lord Michael to the left, Lord Michael above, Lord Michael below, Lord Michael, Lord Michael, wherever I go. I am his love protecting here, I am his love protecting here, I am his love protecting here. That's enough. Isn't that beautiful? You see how that works? You draw forth protection and you seal yourself as you are sealed in this wonderful treasure of heaven, this part of your causal body that protects you. Do you realize that the causal body is shaped like an orange or a globe? It's not flat like this to your hearts. This is one of the things about putting an object like this in form. When you put it in form, you get the concept but you know the earth can be put on a map and laid out, but the earth is a globe. Your causal body is a globe. And it has the white fire core right around the presence with the purity there. It has the golden core around that, like an orange peeling, only it's thick, very thick. And that's filled with all illumination and wisdom that you've ever externalized from God, divine wisdom. And here is love core of love and then mercy and then the violet transmuting flame and then the healing and supply in your life the abundance of life that represents money too and health chlorophyll from the sun power of healing substance you see every time that you do a good deed down on earth the angels of record automatically build up the size of your electronic body. And that's why some of you people that are so little looking down here in the human, some of the little women we have here in the meeting, have an aura that is so big that it would really belie their size. Do you understand what I mean? You're not limited by your physical in these matters. You can be a spiritual giant and have a small physical form <coughs> or you can be as big as I am and have a puny little 
you know. So don't be fooled. Now, the rays of light from your presence signify that your God presence can reach any corner of the universe instantly with the speed of light. Therefore, you really have something omnipotent here, don't you? Omniscient? Yes, omnipresent because it's the presence. That's right. Now here you are down in form. You make a call up to your Holy Christ Self, to your presence. The presence answers and comes down with the energy. And then the tube of light is created in response to your call. The call compels the answer. And down comes the tube of light from the presence, drops all around you, protects you against the arrows and slings of outrageous fortune. Because it stops human creation from coming through. People get on a bus feeling like Betsy Ross. I mean, they get on there feeling very happy and full of inspiration. And they get off feeling like Rip Van Winkle. Because they pick up human creation from the seat they're sitting in. They kept their tube of light around them all the time. They would really protect their health and their happiness, their sanity and their reason. Let's end this session now with our violet flame tube of light decree together. Oh, my constant, loving, I am presence, thou light of God above me, whose radiance forms a circle of fire before me to light my way. I am faithfully calling to thee to place a great pillar of light from my own mighty I am God presence all around me right now today, keeping me back through every passing moment Manifesting as a shimmering shower of our beautiful light, through which nothing human can ever pass, into this beautiful electric circle of divinely charged energy, direct the swift upsurge of the violet fire of freedom's forgiving, transmuting flame, cause the ever-expanding energy of this flame, projected downward into the force field of my human energy, to completely change every negative condition into the positive polarity of my own very God self. Let the magic of His mercy so purify my world with light that all whom I contact shall always be blessed with the fragrance of violets from God's own heart in memory of the blessed dawning day when all discord, cause, effect, record, and memory it is forever changed into the victory of light and the peace of the ascended Jesus Christ. I am now constantly accepting the full power and manifestation of this victory of light and calling it into instantaneous action by my own God-given free will and the power to accelerate without limit the sacred release of assistance from God's own heart until all men are present and God free in the light that never, never, never fails. Thank you, beloved ones.